Actually, don't sit down. Stand up. We're going to pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, the Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art ever present and fillest all things. Treasury of good things and giver of life, come dwell in us. Cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Well, this is the third class in our series on the uh, Desert Fathers. Tonight, we're going to be looking at St. Makarios the Great, also known as the Egyptian, <clears throat> which is not to be confused with another St. Makarios from Egypt, who was the namesake and contemporary of the saint we're going to be celebrating or reading about tonight, um, who is called St. Makarios of Alexandria, you know, which is also in Egypt. But not he's not the Egyptian or the great. And so uh, let's just dig right in. <clears throat> On the 19th of January, we celebrate the memory of our venerable God-bearing father, Makarios the Great, known as the Egyptian. Saint Makarios the Great was born about the year 300 in the village of Jijber in the Nile Delta and worked at first as a camel driver. In obedience to a call from God, he withdrew to a cell in his village with the intention of living alone and applying himself to the life of Askesis in prayer. As the people wanted to make him a priest, he fled to another village. A girl there, who was found to be pregnant, accused him of having violated her in order to justify herself. He was seized and paraded through the streets with saucepans tied around his neck and showered with blows and insults. The saint said nothing in his own defense and even agreed to take on additional work in order to provide for the needs of the woman and child sent by Providence. When his innocence was finally established, the whole village, full of admiration, intended to come to ask his forgiveness but he fled in order to escape vainglory and made his way to the desert of Skitis, a dry and inhospitable area, which he knew through having come that way when he engaged in the nitre trade. He was then 30 years old and gave himself over to all works of Askesis with unstinting zeal. He took only a little bread and water once a week, slept for a few short moments sitting against the wall of his cell, and continued steadfast in silence and in the prayer of the heart, guarding the spirit from every alien thought. Whether he ate or fasted, his body always had an emaciated look, as if he had escaped from, phys from physical laws, for he used to say, <clears throat> the body of someone who is always occupied in purifying his soul is consumed by the grace of God as embers are burnt by the fire. His detachment from worldly goods was such that one day, having surprised a thief stealing a f the few things that he had in his cell, he helped him load them onto his ca camel. He sat in his cell night and day, his hands busy weaving palm leaves, his soul contrite at the remembrance of his sins, and his spirit taken up to heaven. He did not expiate, expatiate in long prayers, but would say at all times, Lord, as thou willest and as thou knowest, have mercy. <clears throat> One day someone asked him how to make progress on the path of salvation. The saint sent him to the cemetery, first to insult the dead and then to praise them. And when he came back, he said, Look, the corpses said not a word to you in reply. Similarly, if you want to be saved, you too must become like a dead man, making as little of the contempt of men as of their praises. The demons were furious at finding themselves thus under a direct attack in their own territory. And they assailed the saint with all their strength, but he drove them back with contempt. One of these unclean spirits confessed to him, everything you do, I do too. You fast, and I also. You keep vigil, and I don't sleep at all. You only win on one point, your humility. Because of that, I can't do anything against you. Through these contests, he acquired expert knowledge of the different kinds of demons. He said that they can be divided into two main categories, one consisting of the spirits which arouse passions such as anger and covetousness, 
and the other, more dreadful, of the spirits which mislead men by spiritual delusion, blasphemy, and heresies. St. Macario soon became renowned all over Egypt on account of his virtue, and many visitors began to win their way towards the wilderness of Skidis. The saint welcomed with joy and simplicity all who came to him, judging no one but supplying generously what was needed for each person, whether a word of, of, of whether a word of edification or a prayer. To honor his guests, he would offer them a little wine and drink with them. But when he was alone again, he would refrain from drinking water for the same number of days as he had drunk cups of wine. They used to say of him that he was like an earthly god. For just as God protects the world by his providence, similarly, Abba Makarios hid the faults that he saw as though he saw them not, and covered all men by his love. His exceeding charity led him to pray with tears even for the damned. One day, as he was walking in the desert, he came upon the skull of a pagan priest, which addressed him, saying, Each time that you have pity on those who are in torments, on us who are plunged into the fire with our faces pressed against the backs of the ones in front, we receive a measure of comfort in being able for a while to see the faces of our fellow sufferers. St. Macarius went to visit St. Anthony the Great, who had a high regard for his virtues and made him one of his disciples and spiritual heirs. On his return to Skidis, he began to accept a stream of disciples and hence is rightly considered to be the founder of that illustrious center of Orthodox monasticism. His earliest disciples included such bright stars in the spiritual firmament as Abba's Moses, who we'll look at in a few weeks, Sisuis, which we looked at last week, Isaiah, Eos, and Zacharias, and many other great strugglers. Each one lived in his own cell, undertaking sufficient manual work during the week to provide a livelihood and perchance to give alms, but above all to serve in the struggle against Akedia, that is sloth, and as a means of keeping the spirit vigilant. The single aim of the monks of Skitis is making in making their great ascetic efforts was to keep the intellect, nous, constantly fixed on God through pure prayer, and they nourished their contemplation by reciting the psalms and long passages of Holy Scripture by heart. When they acquired a church, they all gathered there on Saturday evenings to keep an all-night vigil and to communicate in the Holy Mysteries. In the morning after the liturgy, they shared a fraternal meal, which for many of them was their only repast of the week and they conversed freely, applying to the most prudent among them for edification of soul. Then each one returned to his cell, taking enough palm leaves for the week's work. As the number of disciples and visitors continued to increase, St. Macarius changed his abode several times. He lived at a distance from the other cells with only two companions nearby. He had seen to the construction of an underground passage from his cell to an isolated cave, to which he could secretly withdraw in order to keep his spirit undistracted when visits became too frequent. In the early days, whenever he wanted to attend divine liturgy, he had to go on foot through the burning desert of Nitria, or to Nitria, more than 40 miles away. This proved too much for his disciples to do, and so at the age of 40, urged by St. Anthony, he agreed to accept ordination to the priesthood. The Holy Spirit then granted him abundant charismata of healings, prophecy, and discernment of thoughts. Twice he brought the dead back to life, the first time to make plain the innocence of someone falsely accused of murder, and the second time to prove a, to a heretic the truth of the faith in the resurrection of the body. Drawn by the reputation of St. Macarius and of his disciples, and by fervent preaching of St. Athanasius the in favor of monasticism, men came from all parts of Egypt and from distant provinces of the empire to embrace the angelic life. The desert of Skitis truly became a city where by the end of the century, hundreds of ascetics gathered every Sunday in its four churches. When Lucius, an Arian, seized the Episcopal See of Alexandria in 374, he revived the persecution of the Orthodox. He began by attacking the most of influential monks and had St. Macarios, his namesake, St. Macarius of Alexandria, and other holy fathers deported to an island in the Nile Delta. Their exile turned out to the advantage of the church in that the confessors converted the pagans there, and thanks to the indignant prostate, protestate, prote protests of the people, were soon recalled, returning to their desert with added luster. 
Saint Macarius, conscious of his approaching end, visited his disciples at Nitra for the last time. As a spiritual testament, he exhorted them with tears in his eyes, let us weep, brethren, so that our eyes flow ceaselessly with tears before we go to where our tears will scold our bodies. Some time later, the spiritual father of the desert gave back his soul in peace to the Lord at the age of 90. After being moved from place to place at the time of the Muslim conquest, his precious relics now rest in the Coptic monastery which bears his name built on the site which the saint had sanctified by his presence. In the collection of the wonderful spiritual homilies attributed by tradition to St. Macarius the Great, the saint describes the different effects of the grace of God within us by means of splendid images taken from the natural world. After being joined to the Lord by faith and consecrated to him by renunciation, we ought, he said, to till the earth of the heart. Sounds familiar from this past Sunday to constrain our rebellion, rebellious nature to practice all the holy evangelic virtues, especially assiduity, assiduity in prayer. Seeing our goodwill, Christ will then give us the strength to fulfill all his commandments, or rather he will accomplish them in us himself through the energy of the Holy Spirit. Thus progressing from virtue to virtue and from glory to glory towards complete fulfillment, our spirit will be thoroughly mixed with the fire of the Holy Spirit and becoming all eye, all light, it will partake of the divine attributes. At the time of the general, general resurrection, the fire of the Holy Spirit hidden in the heart of the saints will overflow their bodies and make them shine eternally in the light of God. For St. Macarius, the aim of the Christian life is none other than the acquisition here below of the experience of the Holy Spirit through undergoing that beautiful transformation which will give us a spiritual sensibility, whereby we shall be able to taste the presence of God at every moment in our lives. That last bit there, that the aim of the Christian life is none other than the acquisition here below of the experience of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what St. Seraphim of Sorrow says you know, how many centuries later, that that is the aim of the Christian life, to become a bearer of the Spirit, to really truly possess the Spirit in as much as we can possess God, but possess in ourselves the Spirit of God. We have consistency of teaching, you know, from the early centuries to just a couple of centuries ago. So that is the life of St. Macarius the Great. So as we move into his sayings, we have 41 recorded sayings in the book that we're working through, Sayings of the Desert Fathers. I have selected 18 of the sayings to go through. Um, some of these will be familiar because the, his life mentions them briefly. And they're, uh, they expound on the events or the sayings. And I was f found it interesting as I was going through. Many of his sayings are really long. They're like long stories of what, you know, things that happened. Um, whereas, you know, many of the other saints, their sayings that are recorded are, you know, much shorter, quicker. He does have those, but he also has a number of long ones as well. So the f first saying, a long one, that I picked is saying three. When Abba Macarius dwelt in the great desert, he was the only one living as an anchorite. But lower down, there was another desert where several brothers dwelt. The old man was surveying the road when he saw Satan drawing near in the likeness of a man, and he passed by his dwelling. He seemed to be wearing some kind of cotton garment full of holes, and a small flask hung at each hole. The old man said to him, Where are you off to? He said, I'm going to stir up the memories of the brethren. The old man said, And what is the purpose of these small flasks? He replied, I am taking food for the brethren to taste. The old man said, all those kinds? He replied, yes, for if a brother does not like one sort of food, I offer him another, 
And if it is not like the second any better, I offer him a third. And all these varieties, he will like one at least. With these words, he departed. The old man remained watching the road until he saw him coming back again. When the old man saw him, he said to him, Good health to you. The other replied, How can I be in good health? The old man asked him what he meant. And he replied, Because they all opposed me and no one received me. The old man said, Ah, you do not find any friends down there. And he replied, Yes, I have a monk who is a friend down there. He at least obeys me, and when he sees me, he changes like the wind. The old man asked him the name of this monk. Theopemptos, he replied. With these words, he went away. Then Abba Makarios got up and went to the desert below his own. When they heard of it, the brothers took branches of palm to go meet him. Each one got ready, thinking that it was to him the old man was coming down. But he inquired which was... Which was the one on the mount? But he inquired which was the one on the mountain called Theopemptos, and when he had found out, he went to his cell. Theopemptos received him with joy. When he was alone with him, the old man asked him, "How are you getting on?" Theopemptos replied, "Thanks to your prayers, all goes well." The old man asked, "Do not your thoughts war against you?" He replied, "Up to now, it is all right, for he was afraid to admit some to admit anything." The old man said to him, See how many years I have lived as an ascetic, and am praised by all, and though I am old, the spirit of fornication troubles me. Theopemto said, Believe me, Abba, it is the same with me. The old man went on admitting the other thoughts still warred against him, until he had brought him to admit them about himself. Then he said, How do you fast? He replied, Till the ninth hour. That is, he doesn't eat until the ninth hour. Practice fasting a little later. Meditate on the gospel and the other scriptures, and if an alien thought arises within you, never look at it, but always look upwards, and the Lord will come at once to your help. When he had given the brother this rule, the old man then returned to his solitude. He was watching the road once more when he saw the devil, to whom he asked, Where are you going this time? He replied, To arouse the memories of the brothers. And he went away. When he came back, the saint asked him, How are the brothers? He replied that it had gone badly. The old man asked him why. He replied, they are all obdurate, and the worst is the one friend that I used to obey me. I do not know what has changed him, but not only does he not obey me anymore, but he has become the most obdurate of them all. So I have promised myself not to go down there again, at least not for a long time now. When he had said this, he went away, leaving the old man. And the saint returned to his cell. This uh, story is really important, I think, because it shows us how the devil works. He says that St. Macarius sees the devil walking down the road with all these different flasks, and they represent all these different foods, all these different thoughts that he's going to offer to the brethren. And it shows us that Satan doesn't know what's going to tempt us. He cannot see in our mind. You know, he's not God. But what he does instead, he offers, you know, this little thing. And then he offers this. He offers that. He offers that. And he sees what gets our attention. He sees what attracts us. And then from there, he keeps offering that to us because he knows that'll get to us. And so it shows us how the devil works and how we can um, be on guard and protect ourselves, not only through knowing his, uh, his machinations, but also, you know, in this reply or this uh, rule that St. Makarios gives Theopemptos, when he tells him to practice fasting a little later, so he tells him to fast a little bit more, so they can control himself, meditate on the gospel and the other scriptures. And then I think what's very important, if an alien thought arises within you, there's a thought that comes from outside of yourself, never look at it. So don't even play with it. Don't struggle with it. Don't try to kick it out. Just ignore it. And look upwards to God and the Lord will come at once to your help. So that's how we deal with these thoughts, you know, at least 
from uh, the advice of St. Macarios. We have thoughts that bother us, you know, the temptations that bother us, and the thoughts keep coming, and then Satan is trying to hook us with these thoughts. Try fasting a little bit more. Try reading the, little, the scriptures a little bit more. And most of all, don't even give any attention to the thoughts that come. Immediately, when you see the thoughts in your mind, turn away and turn to God and uh, ask His help. The next saying is saying nine. He also said that when Abba Makarios received all the brethren in simplicity, some of them asked him why he mixed with them like this. He replied, for 12 years I served the Lord so that he might grant me this gift. And do you all advise me to give it up? So we see something similar to uh, what we read about in the life of St. Anthony. Remember when the hunter came across St. Anthony with his brethren? Um, they were, you know, just having a good time, relaxing. And the hunter was kind of scandalized by this. And so the same, you know, these, uh, <clears throat> some of the br these brethren with Abba Makarios are scandalized that he is able to, you know, sit there and, you know, kind of relax with them. And what he says is that he served the Lord for 12 years, that he's, he's, he's really, uh, he's labored spiritually so that he could do this without being, you know, harmed, without having too loose of a tongue, you know, without, you know, um, having inappropriate thoughts, you know, laughing, you know, too much or whatever. So he had trained himself already um, to be able to be in the company of others, to appropriately be able to be in the company of others. So if he's, you know, taking it so seriously, you know, he's in the desert, um, how much more should we be careful <clears throat> with how we interact with other people? <clears throat> and uh, how much we should kind of Keep watch of our mouth when we're out and about. Keep watch over our, what we hear and what we're thinking. Um, we need to train ourselves. You know, we're not going to be able to do it to the same degree that St. Macarius does. But we, <clears throat> we can, at least to a small degree, begin to train ourselves to uh, help um, ourselves to be able to interact appropriately with others so that we don't lose ourselves um, in frivolity or whatever. The next saying, saying 10. They said about Abba Makarios that when he visited the brethren, he laid this rule upon himself. If there is wine, drink some for the brethren's sake. But for each cup of wine, spend a day without drinking water. So the brothers would offer him some refreshment, and the old man would accept it joyfully to mortify himself. But when his disciple got to know about it, he said to the brethren, In the name of God, do not offer him any more, or he will go and kill himself in a cell. When they heard that, the brethren did not offer him any more wine. So uh, we see from this, with the same uh, lesson last week with St. Cisuis, that he would break his fast for the lovers of his brethren. Um, but also, afterwards... He would increase his fast for his love as God, for his, out of his love for God, because he had broken his fast before, you know. Um, and it's interesting that it says that they would offer him some wine, and he would accept it joyfully to mortify himself. You know, typically when we think of ascetics mortifying themselves, it's abstinence. You know, they're hardly eating anything, hardly drinking anything. But in this case, he's mortifying his own ego, his own self-will, and he's humbling himself by actually accepting the wine that he wouldn't normally drink. <clears throat> and then uh, when uh, his disciple reply, or tells the other brothers to stop giving him wines, he's not saying, obviously, he's going to actually commit suicide, but he's saying he's going to stop drinking water for so long because you give, give, keep giving him wine that he's going to die. And so uh, they stopped doing it. The next one I have is saying 11. 
When Abba Makarios was returning from the marsh to his cell one day, carrying some palm leaves, he met the devil on the road with a scythe. The latter struck at him as much as he pleased, but in vain, and he said to him, What is your power, Makarios, that it makes me so powerless against you? All that you do, I do too. You fast, so do I. You keep vigil, and I do not sleep at all. In one thing only do you beat me. Abba Makarios asked what that was. He said, Your humility. Because of that, I can do nothing against you. So it's the same story we heard um, in his life. And it sh just it shows us the greatness of humility. This is, uh, this is what we uh, should be striving for, this virtue of humility, not feigned humility or false humility like we often like to have, but true humility um, because it protects us and it differentiates us from the demons, as you see. Because, like it says, they don't fast, you know. And they uh, also don't sleep, you know. St. James in his epistle says that, you know, they believe in God, they know he's there. You know, but they can never be humble. They can't humble themselves. They're filled with pride. And so, if we want to be protected from the demons, the more we can clothe ourselves with humility, the more we'll find that safety. The next saying is saying 14. It was said of Abba Makarios the Egyptian that one day when he was going up from Skitis with a load of baskets, baskets he sat down, overcome with weariness, and began to say to himself, My God, you know very well that I cannot go any further. And immediately he found himself at the river. You know, so I don't have much to say about it. I just thought it was very, uh, it's a nice little picture from, this, uh, from his life. Where he's kind of, uh, he's too tired. He can't go any further. And he, you know, Complains to God, so to speak, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's he's there where he needs to be. We see this, uh, you know, in various uh, saints' lives as well. Um, but it's, but it was very, uh, you know, nice. You know, he's and he, it, this, this teaches us also an important lesson to keep, uh, you know, open communication with God. Um, another place, another um, recent. I think it was a higher monk I saw a video of, you know, he, he called uh, it uh, Oh, shoot, I'm forgetting exactly what he uh, kind of termed uh, this, but it's basically saying, you know, you, you should be continually, uh, you know, talking with God, you know, even telling him your complaints, your troubles, so that, you know, eventually it turns into, you know, it turns into a prayer. And that's the same thing we see St. Macarius doing. He's, uh, he's kind of given up and he uh, announces his trouble and God comes to his aid. Next is saying 16. Abba Mac Macarius the Great said to the brothers at Skitis, when he dismissed the assembly, flee, my brothers. One of the old men asked him, where could we flee to be on this desert? He put his finger on his lips and said, flee that. And he went into his cell, shut the door and sat down. Flee that. So we have another example of a saint talking to us about... Not exactly. <laughs> Not saying things we shouldn't say being watchful over our speech. Have we got the picture about how important it is yet? If not, we still have four more weeks. <laughs> the next is uh, saying 17, the next one. The same Abba Makaro said, if you reprove someone, you yourself get carried away by anger, anger and you are satisfied of your... And you are... Okay, I'm starting over. The same Abba Makaria said, if you reprove someone, 
You yourself get carried away by anger, and you are satisfying your own passion. Do not lose yourself, therefore, in order to save another. So it's kind of like what we were talking about at the end of uh, last week um, during the questions. Um, talking about how to, and if to, and when to actually speak up to uh, speak to someone about, you know, whatever it is. And I was saying we have to watch over ourselves, our, um, you know, how our heart is moving. If it's, we feel the need to say something out of anger or, you know, what's going on in there. And, um, you know, oftentimes it's better to not say anything because as, you know, Simicara says, we might lose ourselves and we're trying to save someone else. So, you know, we uh, will be in a worse off spot than before. Next is saying 19. Abba Macarius was asked, how should one pray? The old man said, there is no need at all to make long discourses. Is it, it is enough to stretch out one's hands and say, Lord, as you will and as you know, have mercy. And if the conflict grows fiercer, say, Lord, help. He knows very well what we need, and he shows us his mercy. So we have uh, this tradition of short prayers. Obviously, the greatest of them is the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You know, in this, uh, this prayer that St. Macarius made his own, Lord, as you will, and as you know, have mercy. You know, it's basically the same thing as the Jesus prayer, just in a different, you know, words. But it's interesting that he says, if the conflict grows fiercer, say, Lord, help. So he even shortens the prayer, you know, if, you know, whatever temptation you're going through becomes stronger. And I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but it's just like using, you know, there's a sh shorter version of the Jesus prayer. There's a longer version of the Jesus prayer. And uh, the shorter version of the Jesus prayer, your mind has less time to kind of trail off in between the prayer or as the prayer goes on. So if you're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You know, it's a lot faster, a lot more focused than Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, he's, um, and so I think it's the same kind of idea. You know, when you're in a temptation, you know, you just want to get the words out quick so that, you know, your mind is dwelling in God and you're asking him to help you and you don't have as much time to kind of stop and think about the temptation, to dwell on it so that you don't, you know, aren't conquered by it. And the next is saying 23. A brother came to see Abba Macarius the Egyptian and said to him, Abba, give me a word that I may be saved. So the old man said, go to the cemetery and abuse the dead. The brother went there, abused them and threw stones at them. Then he returned and told the old man about it. The latter said to him, Didn't they say anything to you? He replied, No. The old man said, Go back tomorrow and praise them. So the brother went away and praised them, calling them apostles, saints, and righteous men. He returned to the old man and said to them, I have complimented them. And the old man said to him, Did they not answer you? The brother said, No. The old man said to him, You know how you insulted them and they did not reply, and how you praised them and they did not speak. So you too, if you wish to be saved, must do the same and become a dead man. Like the dead, take no account of either the scorn of men or their praises, and you can be saved. You know, as Christians, we're uh, called to live a stable life. We're not to, called to be, live in too high of a state, too low of a state. You know, we don't want to be walking around depressed all the time. And we don't want to be walking around all happy all the time. Called to, you know, balance. And this is uh, one way that we can accomplish this. is by living in the middle. So that when we're praised, it doesn't matter. 
that we're, you know, humbling ourselves and not allowing that praise to cause pride, vain glory within us. <clears throat> but on the other hand, when we're insulted, or abused, whatever, you know, we don't give it any thoughts. We don't take it personally. We don't think too highly of ourselves, like, how dare you, you know? How could you say that? You know, I'm this and that, and blah, blah, blah. But it's uh, finding uh, ways to live life in the middle so that no matter what happens, we're not affected either way. You know, so it's, and this is, you know, what... Um, Well, never mind. But, uh, you know, this is, uh, you like us to becoming like a dead man. You know, it's not like we don't have any personality, but it's just in the way we react. You know, St. John Chrysostom also says this about priests because, you know, he, sh he talks about, you know, how the priest has to disregard you know, anything, basically, that uh, people say to him. So if they, oh, you, you know, you, your speech is so nice, you know, just let it go. Or, you know, if they, you know, curse you or whatever. Um, it's like, don't think too much of it, you know. Um, but, you know, this is the Christian life in general, not just a priest's way of life or hopefully a priest's way of life. And so... Let's move on to the next one, saying 24. One day when Abba Macarius was going down to Egypt with some brethren, he heard a boy saying to his mother, Mother, there is a rich man who likes me, but I detest him. And on the other hand, there is a poor man who hates me, and I love him. Hearing these words, Abba Macarius marveled. So the brethren said to him, What is this saying, Abba, that makes you marvel? And the old man said to them, Truly our Lord is rich and loves us, and we do not listen to him, while our enemy the devil is poor and hates us, but we love his impurity. You know, how uh, <laughs> kind of pierces the heart to hear that. How uh, we look at our own lives, how often we desire the wrong thing, the wrong way, the wrong person. Um, the Lord gives us everything we could possibly want. But often, that path is not an easy path to walk. To be able to stay close to the Lord, as he said himself, we should expect, you know, tribulation. We um, should expect, you know, all kinds of insults and persecution and difficulties in life. <clears throat> Well, the, well the, on the other hand, the devil, who gives us nothing except for pain and suffering, you know, he offers, you know, what seem like sweet things. But, you know, it's like a, uh, what's a nice thing to say? Um, you know, it's like candy coating over a, a turd. <laughs> um you know, <coughs> tastes sweet at first, and then uh, comes another flavor. You know, <laughs> you know this is uh, often this conflict that rages inside us that we feel like is uh, you know, sometimes tearing us apart. And this is what, you know, St. Paul talks about when he says, you know, that which I will to do, I don't do. And that which I will not to do, that's I do. You know, this is um, the difficulty of earthly life. We're often split and scattered. And our job is to become, you know, unified in ourself. To have a singular focus so that we don't feel this pulling apart. This... Uh, stress in our lives. Next one is saying 30. The brethren came one day to Abba Makarios at Skitis, 
and they found nothing in this cell except stagnant water. So they said to him, Abba, come up to the village and we will get some clean water for you. The old man said to them, Brothers, do you know so-and-so's bakery in the village? They said to him that they did. The old man said to them, I know it too. Do you know so-and-so's field where the river runs? They said, Yes. The old man said to them, I know it too. So when I want to, I can go there myself without your help. <laughs> this is... Uh, this was... And shows us a glimpse of how detached um, and unconcerned he was about bodily comforts. He didn't care that his water was stagnant. It was old, dirty. Um, it was enough for him to get by. And if he needed to change it, you know, he wasn't dumb. If he needed to get water, you know, he could do it himself. He wasn't, you know, worried about you know everyone, everyone doing something for him. <clears throat> Next is saying 31. They said of Abba Makarios that if a brother came to see him with fear, like someone coming to see a great and holy man, he did not say anything to him. But if one of the brethren said to him as though to humiliate him, Abba, when you were a camel driver and sold nitre and sold it again, did not the keepers beat you? If someone talked to him like that, he would talk to them with joy about whatever they asked him. So we get a glimpse into, you know, this, uh, his, his uh, s struggle to acquire humility. So it says that if someone acted like they were coming to see, you know, some holy man, he wouldn't really give them the time of day. He didn't want to be that holy man to them. But when people would give him the opportunity to become more humble, and uh, you know, ask him questions um, that might be humiliating to him. He embraced it. You know, he he in engaged in that that's that inner struggle to embrace the humiliation, so that he could become more humble and acquire more humility. And uh, then it's uh, like it says he would, you know, talk to him about whatever they wanted because they had given him the opportunity to become more humble. And so he was filled with joy because of that. And, you know, this conversation would flow about whatever. So next we have saying 32. They said of Abba Makarios the Great that he became, as it is written, a god upon earth. Because just as God protects the world, so Abba Makarios would cover the faults which he saw as though he did not see them, and those which he heard as though he did not hear them. How difficult that is. When we see someone doing something, we hear about something that happened, you know, how many of us, you know, actually try to act as if we didn't see or we didn't hear. You know, the same image is given to us after the flood. Remember, the waters recede, Noah and his family come out, Noah plants a vineyard, he has grapes, he makes wine, he gets drunk, he's naked. So two of his sons, well one son sees him naked and then he goes and tells his brothers, hey, our dad's drunk and naked. Um, and to the two other brothers, rather than you know telling anyone else, what they do is they you know, lock arms together or, and they put a blanket over them and they walk backwards to cover him so that no one else would see his nakedness. And see exactly. And they don't see it. No one else will see it. And they cover his faults. You know, and this is really what most of us are called to do. You know, we're not called to, you know, tell people where they're wrong. We're not called to, uh, you know, be the great correctors of people. <clears throat> We're called to cover over people like uh, Noah's sons did, like St. Macario's did. So we're called to love others, you know, um, especially through prayer. I think oftentimes we think uh, our words 
you know, our knowledge or whatever will help someone more than actually praying for them. You know, we can help them more than God can help them. Um, you know, so the more we can do this and cover over, over people's faults, the more God will cover over our, our faults. Just a few more here. The next is saying 36. Abba Makario said, if we keep remembering the wrongs which men have done to us, we destroy the power of the remembrance of God. But if we remind ourselves of the evil deeds of the demons, we shall be invulnerable. The remembrance of wrongs is spiritual suicide. When we get fixated and focused on you know, how people have harmed us, we destroy our spiritual life. And like St. Macario says, it doesn't allow for us to remember actually God throughout our day because we're always worried about what happened to us, you know, that this or that person did or said. But on the other hand, he says, if we can remind ourselves of the evil demons or the evil deeds of the enemy, of the demons, we can be protected against them. If we're, you know, remembering God, and thinking about you know, the traps that the evil one often uses, we'll be more ready to see, more ready and prepared to see and to be aware of what's going on around us in our mind, in our thoughts, in our senses, and to avoid you know, those temptations. So we have saying 37, next one. Abba Pafnutios, the disciple of Abba Makarios, repeated the saying of the old man. When I was small with the other children, I used to eat bilberries, and they used to go and steal and they used to go and steal the little figs. As they were running away, they dropped one of the figs, and I picked it up and ate it. Every time I remember this, I sit down and weep. Think about spiritual sensitivity of this. He picked up a fig that was not his when he was a child. You know, it seems harmless. It was already on the ground. It was going to rot. And he ate it. But he still remembers this even to his, into his old age. He remembers that he took something that was not his and he consumed it. And because of that, he would sit down and cry. You know, this is, um, this is how the spiritual experience the spiritual life. They have a great sensitivity so that the smallest, most minute of things become great tests for them. They become some of the biggest things that they want to overcome. You know, even giving someone an inappropriate look of anger or something, you know, which, you know, to most of us, you know, they might, it might be, it might be a little annoying, you know, but for the most part, it's gonna, we're going to get over it, you know. But the smallest things become the, some of the biggest things to those who have the spiritual sensitivity and they're trying to perfect every part of their life. Not just kind of like the big overarching stuff that we're all trying to do, but even try to get down into the uh, nitty gritty of everything. Two more. Saying 38. Abba Makario said, Walking in the desert one day, I found the skull of a dead man lying on the ground. As I was moving it with my stick, the skull spoke to me. I said to it, Who are you? The skull replied, I was the high priest of the idols and of the pagans who dwelt in this place. But you are Makarios, the spirit bearer. Whenever you take pity on those who are in torments and pray for them, they fill a little respite. 
The old man said to him, What is this alleviation and what is this torment? He said to him, As far as the sky is removed from the earth, so great is the fire beneath us. We ourselves standing in the midst of the fire, from the feet up to the head. It is not possible to see anyone face to face, but the face of one is fixed to the back of another. Yet when you pray for us, each of us can see the other's face a little. Such is our respite. The old man in tears said, Alas, the day when that man was born. He said to the skull, Are there any punishments which are more painful than this? The skull said to him, There is a more grievous punishment down below us. The old man said, Who are the people down there? The skull said to him, We have received a little mercy since we did not know God. But those who know God and denied him are down below us. Then picking up the skull, the old man buried it. How many lessons can we take away from this saying? First, we're given a a glimpse into the spiritual power of not only prayer, but the divine liturgy. You know, the prayer par excellence of the church, the worship of the church. You know, in the divine liturgy, we pray for the living and the reposed, especially the priest. Before the liturgy starts, we have the service of the proscomedia, where he prepares the bread that's going to be used in the liturgy. You know, he prepares what's be called the lamb, you know, what will actually become the body of Christ. And then he makes a number of commemorations. You know, the first one after he prepares the lamb is that of, he takes a piece out of the loaf in honor of the Theotokos and puts that next to the lamb. And then he has commemorations of various ranks of saints. So you have the angels, you have the prophets, you have the apostles, hierarchs, martyrs, um, holy monastics, unmercenary healers, and then um, Joachim and Anna and the saints that are commemorated that day. And then lastly, um, he, the priest commemorates the um, saint whose liturgy we're serving, so either John Chrysostom or Basil the Great. After that, the priest makes commemorations of the living and the departed. And so, you know, he first commemorates his bishop, or in our case, our metropolitan, then our bishop. And then he commemorates um, his sponsors at ordination and whoever else he wants to commemorate. Um, priests normally have like a, a long list of, you know, family and friends and things like this, and people they know need the prayer, then, you know, their parishioners, things like this. Afterwards, then he goes on and commemorates those who are reposed, the departed from among us. And during the proscomedia, the priest uh, only commemorates Orthodox departed, people who departed in the faith. Um, we don't pray for um, non-Orthodox or people, lapsed Orthodox who never repented before the, their end. Um, as a precaution, just like we don't give funerals to suicides because we want to warn others, if you do these things, you won't be prayed for in the appropriate ways. And so we can only pray for those who remained in communion. Um, and. We have, I mean, numerous testimonies of saints and uh, elders and, you know, holy people who have said that they see, you know, sometimes see the people that they commemorate, the departed, you know, and they tell them how much it helps them, you know, how much grace they get from it. And so in this case, we, uh, we have St. Macarios. He's praying not only for the departed, you know, um, faithful, but he's departing for the departed, you know, of everyone who's lived. Um, and we're given a glimpse <clears throat> into a little bit of his prayer and how it helps them, you know, it's like a little kind of rest from the great torments they're experiencing. Um, so we uh, 
through stories like this and other stories, we can see the great um, help and power of our prayer for the departed and what it does for them and how it helps them and how God hears us and he <coughs> accepts our prayers on behalf of their, them because they can no longer pray for themselves. Um, and you know, it helps them in the next life. Um, another thing we see from this story <coughs> is that we get a little glimpse of what kind of the next life is like for those who are unbelievers, who have not been uh, accepted into paradise for whatever reason. You see how it's, he, the, this pagan priest describes the torments as being in flames, but also not being able to see anyone's faces. They're deprived of communion with another person by not being able to see their face. They're not just separated from God, they're separated basically from everybody. Exactly. Yeah. But when, like it says, when St. Macarius prays for them, they can see other people's faces a little bit and it gives them some rest from the torments. And lastly, the major thing that we see in this is that God judges to a greater degree those who have the truth and then, for whatever reason, discarded it. Either because they never wanted to repent or they went somewhere else to another religion or whatever it is, or they just didn't do the work that was required of a Christian. Um, those people are in a worse state than even unbelievers. And last, saying 39. <clears throat> it's said of Abu Makarios the Egyptian that one day he went up from Skitis to the mountain of Nitria. As he approached the place, he told his disciple to go on ahead. When the latter had gone on ahead, he met the priest of the pagans. The brother shouted after him, saying, Oh, oh, devil, where are you off to? The priest turned back and beat him and left him half dead. Then picking up his stick, he fled. When he had gone a little further, Abba Makarios met him running and said to him, Greetings, greetings, you weary man. Quite astonished, the other came up and said to him, what good do you see in me that you greet me this way? The old man said to him, I have seen you wearing yourself out without knowing that you are wearing yourself out in vain. The other said to him, <clears throat> I have been touched by your greeting, and I realize that you are on God's side. But, the, but another wicked monk who met me insulted me, and I've given him blows enough for him to die of them. The old man realized that he was referring to his disciple. Then the priest fell at his feet and said, I will not let you go till you have made me a monk. When they came to the place where the brother was, they put him on to their shoulders and carried him to the church in the mountain. When the people saw the priest with Makarios, they were astonished, and they made him a monk. Through him, many pagans became Christians. So Abba Makarios said, One evil word makes even the good evil, while one good word makes even the evil good. Another lesson in speech and how important it is. We see that this monk, this disciple of St. Macarius, you know, thought himself better than a pagan priest. And the pagan, pagan priest beat him and, uh, you know, didn't think very highly of him. But St. Macarius, you know, greets him like a normal human being. Even though they are completely different in their beliefs, you know, their whole lives, everything. And to his Saint Macarius's kindness, kindness, the priest is converted, you know, right there. He's converted not only to Christianity but to the ascetic life. So we don't know what kind of kind word will enlighten someone, will help someone. And though we may disagree with a great many people nowadays about a great many things, 
we have to remember that no matter who it is or what we're talking about and however much they might have smeared and marred the image of God within them, they're still made in the image of God. And it's, uh, you know, our job to try to uh, you know, speak to people like that, to look past everything and to see what's truly important. You know, that's, I'm done. <laughs>